So this one is called Fish in Time. It's a video based arcade game and it's having monitor issues. I'll try to find a, an old video I think I have of uh, what exactly it was doing at first. Um, but basically when we bought this it was working fine and then when we got it here it had some uh, waviness on the sides of the screen and it was kind of a purplish tinge. Now we left it at the time because I wasn't too familiar with arcade monitors and because it was only happening where uh, a rock usually was on the screen so it didn't really affect gameplay too much. Now recently it started doing a thing where sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't and when I was first checking it out I tried hitting the screen and I noticed that if you hit the screen it would, it would, this, what was on the screen would uh, change, you'd get little blips and glitches here and there. Now, that's a classic sign of a cold solder joint. So I pulled the chassis out and I started poking around it a bit. And I'm going to go ahead and show you the chassis. So this is the uh, monitor chassis from the Fish in Time. Over here is the neck board. It's not really too much of a concern. Now this chassis is made by Neiman Video Displays. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it says right there, it's manufactured August of 2009. This model is a... 1127CH288 27, it's probably a 27 inch yeah I'd say it's probably about a 27 inch but size is not really important in this particular scenario so these cha uh, monitor chassis are supposed to be pretty reliable from what I've heard um, but when I got it off I noticed immediately that there are some very glaring issues which I'm going to have to show you. I did find a number of cold solder joints which I will show you now. I'm going to have to put the camera in macro so you can see it. So over here I'm going to show you the first cold solder joint and you can see the lead is like just it's not even connected to the joint anymore and if we go around the board you can see that with a number of other components. Let's see if I'm in the right spot here. I think you can see that that joint is also very loose. And there's another capacitor right next to it. I need to find it. Oh. And you can see that one is just incredibly loose as well. So back on the top side now, I can show you what capacitors and components those loose joints correspond to. The first one is this capacitor right over here and then this here, I believe this is a coil, this is also loose and then the capacitor next to it is loose as well. So definitely some very loose solder joints. Now that could explain most of our issues alone but I was looking at this and I noticed that we got a lot of uh, not too high brand, high quality uh, capacitors here. Uh, this one here, this is a G Luxian and this big one, this is a Tipo. We got another Tipo over here. This one's an Elna, which is decent. And the only one I'm really happy with is the uh, Rubicon back here. Uh, this capacitor, this one is just some other random name I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, they're okay, but they're not too great. And the main reason I wanted to go ahead and uh, consider replacing those is because this one over here, this big one, I don't know if you can see it. Let's try macro. You might be able to just barely see it, but the very top of this, it's not like bulging out and bursting, but it's starting to bulge just a tiny bit. Now the reason that concerns me is because number one, that's obviously showing early signs of capacitor failure. The other thing is that in my reading, I read that these TIPOs really do not like heat. The heat just kills them really fast. And if you look at this board, let's blur it again. So if you look at this board, you'll notice that this capacitor is right in the middle of a very high heat area. You've got these two wire round resistors near it, and there's two more over there. Plus you've got this heat sink component over here and this is actually in the main power section. So that's going to put a lot of heat on that capacitor and I know those capacitor, that capacitor brand does not like heat. So unfortunately I cannot easily find a capacitor kit for this particular 
Well, once again, my camera battery died, so I had to switch to my phone. But anyway, I could not find a uh, standard capacitor kit to just replace all the capacitors on this chassis, which is what you would normally do in this situation. I'm not really sure why I just couldn't find one. Um, but I did want to replace some of these capacitors. Now, the ones I've chosen to replace are this big one that's starting to bulge, and then this one down here, and these two right here. So, over here I've got new capacitors. So, I've got Nichicon capacitors for these, this one, and these two. And then for that other smaller one, this is a Panasonic capacitor because I simply could not find what I was looking for to replace it in a Nichicon brand. So I'm going to solder all those in. I'm going to check all the other joints as well while I'm at it. We'll pop this back in the uh, game and we'll see how it does. So the new capacitors are in. Just need to trim the leads. We've got the old capacitors here. Now these three up here are probably fine. I'm sure they test out just fine. They are a bit light uh, compared to what I normally like to see. This one on the other hand Get closer. Let me see if I can. There we go. So this one is the one that I thought was a little bulgy. And you notice on the top, it's got a slight bulge to it, but it doesn't look too bad. But on the bottom, you can see it is starting to bulge out around one of those legs. It's all crooked there, and it's also got seeing some uh, corrosion starting. So this capacitor was definitely on its way out. So it's a good thing we replaced that. Um, I also went through and basically re every joint that I thought looked suspicious. I found a bunch of them uh, on various capacitors. I also found them on the larger resistors. So we turn this up now. You can see my new capacitor over there. And then these two new ones over here. These are much smaller than the old ones, but the same value. And then that last one over here. Uh, these various uh, large power resistors are the ones that I saw the most issues with on the joints. So if you're looking for cold solder joints on one of these, look around the capacitors and the resistors. That's where I found most of them. And for anybody who's wondering about finding cold solder joints, uh, best recommendation I can give you is just Google it and do some reading on cold solder joints. That will give you a better idea of how to find them. When I look for them, basically I just look for any solder joint that looks questionable. A cold solder joint usually uh, looks kind of dull and uh, it'll look like it has fractures in it. Uh, my basic attitude when I have to uh, hunt down cold solder joints is just if it looks questionable, resolder it. Because if you uh, miss one or you skip over one and that ends up being the one that was causing the problems, well, now you just put the whole thing back in and now you gotta take it all back out again and continue chasing your tail around in circles trying to find out what's wrong with it. So, I'm going to trim the leads off this. We're going to throw it back in the uh, back in the game, hook it up to the monitor. We'll see if it works. So, looking at the uh, back of the game here, you'll notice that all the labels are upside down. That's because this monitor actually sits upside down. I'm not really sure why they chose to do it that way. They just did, but so the chassis mounts up there. And then connection for the uh, anode is up there. Now, before I put the chassis in though, these monitors are known to uh, build up a charge even when they're just sitting. This has been sitting for a couple weeks now, but it could still have a bit of a charge in there, which is not going to be fun if it hits you and these do develop enough power when running to kill you. So. Safety first, we're going to discharge the anode. Yep, this one looks like it was mostly discharged, it only just got a little tiny pop. You probably couldn't even hear it, but I could hear it. Anyway, that should be safe now. But I have seen them build up much more of a charge than that. We can put the uh, chassis back in, try to remember where everything goes, fire it up, see how it works. So 
upside down funky mind chassis all in. Didn't shock myself. Let's see if it works. Oh, sounds good. That fan doesn't sound good. Gonna have to put that on the list. Nope, that doesn't look quite right. So there's two sets of uh, yoke connectors and just plug it into the other set made it right side up now but that's still not how it's supposed to look. So in the process of repairing that board I did find an issue which is what I suspect is causing the picture issues at this point. Now this is the adjustment board for the chassis and if you notice, let me focus in on that. So this is the vertical size potentiometer and you can see it's broken. Now this board was kicking around in the back and I guess people weren't too careful around it and that ended up getting broken. You can see I tried to solder it back on on one side, however the other trace was, was just completely broken. There was no way I could fix that. Uh, so I stuck it on to, to see what would happen and hoping that it wouldn't be too much of a deal, but uh, turns out it is. Uh, hopefully this is what's causing the funky picture. Uh, I do know it's definitely causing some of the funky picture because after the solder joint broke off again, the picture got significantly worse. So hopefully by just replacing that, that'll solve the picture issues. I do have some new ones here, some new potentiometers. They aren't exactly the same, but this is what I could get on short notice. So these are, these have uh, the abbreviation 202 on them, just like the old one. So 2000 ohm potentiometer. Big Bug Hunter is going through its demo mode in the background, but we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and solder in that new one. We're gonna try it out. Hopefully, this will fix everything. So. Got the new, so the new potentiometer is in the adjustment board. Had to add a bit of wire to extend the leads because it wasn't exactly the same, but same value, so functions the same, just looks a little bit different. So here is where we are at now. And of course there's a bar because I'm taking video of a CRT, but the waving that I was getting along these rocks is now gone. However, the edge of the screen, as you can see, is not perfectly straight on either side. And we're also still getting some of that purplish color on the sides and down here. The color isn't exactly right. So there's still something wrong with it, maybe convergence. I'm not sure, I'm gonna have to look into it a little bit farther, but for now, it's a lot better than it was and it's serviceable, so probably have to do an update to this once I figure out exactly what's causing these other issues, but at least now it works 100% of the time and it doesn't have that waviness anymore.